On behalf of Wolfsneck Farm, I welcome all of you. My name is Judy Higby, and I am on the board at Wolfsneck Farm, and we are so excited to see such a, a welcoming and large audience for our um, fourth in the Winter Forum series. I want to take a moment to thank um, all of our community supporters who have helped us get the word out about um, this uh, lecture. Uh, Freeport Conservation Trust, Freeport Community Services, the Historical Society here in Freeport, Coastal Studies for Girls, uh, Portland Permaculture, Maine AmeriCorps, Merry Meeting Community Shares, Friends of Merry Meeting Bay, Rippling Waters Farm, Transition Towns of Greater Brunswick, Frontier Cafe, Gold Star Honeybees, Freeport Community Gardens, and Freeport Community Library. Uh, we're so grateful that, that all of those organizations have worked with us to uh, spread the word. Um, we are most fortunate to have Bill here tonight because um, his equally famous brother, Tom McKibben, is uh, on the Education Committee at uh, Wolf's Neck Farm. Bill has been heading up the amazing crew at 350.org, which I hope you've all logged into, and I know many of you probably participated in. Last fall, they organized the largest worldwide day action in the history of our planet. I, I want to talk about the local and the global in the same breadth, because in my work as a writer and in my work as an organizer, there's always a kind of tension between those two scales, between the local and the global, but also a great deal of, um, of synergy, of ability to get them to work together sometimes. And I think we have to start thinking on those scales in, in important ways. January and February were the warmest January and February ever recorded on this planet, according to the satellite data from the University of Alabama that was just published. Uh, we see, for instance, uh, remarkable increases in the amount of moisture in the atmosphere because warm air holds more water vapor than cold, about 5% more water in the atmosphere than there was in 1970. That's not a trivial change. That's an enormous change in one of the biggest systems on the planet. And it's the reason why we can have, say, record snowfalls and record rainstorms and 100-year floods coming every five or 10 years. The first thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to adapt. Um, because we've already warmed the planet in profound ways, and we're going to continue to warm it, even if we do everything right from this point in. We've got at least another degree or so of warming already built into the system, heat that's stored for the moment in the oceans, but coming out into the atmosphere. Um, um, that will make bigger change than we've seen already, and we've already seen lots of change in lots of parts of the world. We're more vulnerable in our communities and in our systems than we would have thought possible even a few years ago. Take, for instance, our food system, since we're talking about tonight a farm. Um, vulnerable not only because our modern industrial agricultural system runs on fossil fuel, it's vulnerable not only because we're beginning to run short of oil, but it's vulnerable because those few crops on which we've built this huge industrial system are as vulnerable as anything else to increases in temperature. There have been a series of new studies in the last year or two indicating that as temperatures continue to rise, we're going to begin to see and may already be seeing decreases in yield for many of the major crops around the world. Uh, decreases in yield that could reach 30 or 40 or 50 percent by century's end as temperatures climb. Because those crops, corn and soybeans and wheat and rice, are at least as adapted to the world that they've known or that we've known on their behalf as we are. The good news, and it's very good news, is that we're beginning to understand, too, how we might be able to deal with all of this. And, and Wolf's Neck and projects like it are perfect examples of what I mean. The explosive growth in, say, the local food movement in the last 10 years is, is wonderful to see. Here in Maine, thanks to the incredible work of the uh, 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 folks up in Unity and, and, and around the state, the sort of organic and local food uh, system has been a model for the rest of the country. Uh, around 
the United States, in the last five years, the agricultural census showed an increase, pretty substantial increase, in the number of farms in this country. That's the first time that's happened in 150 years. Important as all this local work is, by itself, it can't deal with the scale of problems that we have. And by itself, it can't reach its full flowering until we make changes as well at the global level, at the national and global level. Until we also, at the same time that we're planting seeds and putting up windmills, do the work of politics to make sure that we have a system that helps instead of hinders the kind of changes that we need. Any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed or to which life on Earth is adapted. It's pretty fundamental, pretty strong, and pretty bleak when you realize that we're already well past 350. The atmosphere outside tonight holds about 390 parts per million CO2, and it's rising about two parts per million per year. That's why the Arctic is melting. It's from U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan who'd made a 350 with sandbags, and they sent us a note saying, we are parked our Humvee for the weekend. We're walking where we need to go. <laughs> you know? um, we did, however, take over Times Square for part of the day um, and rented out a bunch of those big jumbotron advertising signs that are normally showing vodka ads or whatever. And we were putting up these pictures as they came in from around the world, as people were uploading them in real time. These are orphans. Uh, There's a big orphanage in Indonesia, and they'd been studying global warming with all the kids, and they put all those bottles, collected bottles all day and put them in the 350, and they sent us a note in broken English, and it ended by saying, um, even though no one caring about us, we caring about the earth. And we haven't yet convinced the richest, most powerful, and most addicted nations to do anything. Ours at the top of the list. Uh, and China close behind. The main thing I want to tell you tonight, ask you tonight, is to please circle the 10th of October on your calendar for this year. We're going to do another big global day, but it's not going to be like this one. It's going to be, we're calling it a global work party. And all over the world, in places just like Wolf's Neck Farm or other places around uh, this part of Maine or around any of those places, people are going to be doing, at least for a day, the real work that needs doing, putting up solar panels, insulating homes, uh, digging new community gardens, uh, laying down bike paths in the streets, whatever it is, whatever kind of work we need to do. Um, we need great pictures of those things with big 350s in the foreground to help make the case because the case we're going to make is not that this is what will solve the problem, but the very powerful points that will be made by that day are two. One, that our local communities and local places know how to adapt and will try their best to figure out what's going on. And two, that if we can do this work, if we can get up on the roof of the school and put on the solar panels, if we, then for damn sure people in the Senate and in the General Assembly can do their work. You know? Their Their job, their job is writing legislation. That's what they're supposed to do, you know, to deal with these kind of problems on that kind of scale as we in our own communities deal with them on our local scale. So we're very hopeful that you'll help in all the places you are with all the talent you have in that global work party on the 10th of October. And we're also really hopeful that you'll do in the next month or two some serious spreading of that news through your networks. Now we know that a coal-fired power plant operated exactly the way it's supposed to will destroy the planet. Nothing has to go wrong. It just has to do what it's going to do. So that's good to know. But that said, it's, I think nuclear power has a very small part to play, if any, in the energy transition for a couple of reasons. One of them is the set of reasons that you already all know about and don't need me to talk about. You know, the 
things we haven't yet figured out how to do with waste. And what, but even if you're willing to take all those kind of risks, the, the, the other cost that is going to keep nuclear power from playing a real role is the enormous economic price tag that comes with it. That in a way is almost suggested by the architecture of the internet itself. A decentralized kind of world, a world where food comes from a million different places instead of a few huge ones, where energy comes from a million rooftops instead of a few big power plants, and where political energy comes from a million places scattered all over. But the biggest part of all of this is changing the price of energy. And that's what all this effort in Washington and in the UN is about. Some law that will finally put a cap on the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere 